Okay, how do I get the... Okay, we're ready. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Bruce Campbell. I lead the Climate Change, Agriculture, and Food Security Program of the CGR. Um, and so I welcome you to this session this afternoon. So it's, to me, it's a lot about time dimensions and how in the climate change world we're doing predictions to 2100 and if you're lucky to 2050. And in the policy world, we're talking about decisions that need to be done in the next two weeks or in, perhaps if you're lucky in two years time, but it, it, very short dimensions. So I think the overall question for this uh, panel and group of speakers is how do we better deal with climate change impacts that make sense to policymakers as opposed to the very long projections. So we're going to have four pro short presentations from scientists on different aspects, biodiversity, climate information services, forest fires, uh, climate adaptation by farmers. And then we'll have a presentation from a policymaker looking at a different kind of set of questions. How does science information get to policymakers? What works and what doesn't work in linking policy and, and, and uh, science? What do scientists and policymakers have to do differently to, to make the linkage better? And then we've got pl plenty of time for discussion. So we've got uh, five presentations, short presentations. We've said 12 minutes, but we may uh, a little bit of a leeway on each. And then the second hour we'll have for discussions. So the first speaker is Walter Batkin. Uh, he's the head of regional and sectoral research program at IRI. It's the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, or for Society and Climate, at the Earth Institute, Columbia University. And over to you, Walter. Thank you. So, as Bruce was saying, uh, one of the main objectives of our work is trying to inform policy makers, decision makers, planning, etc. And when we're talking about adaptation, decision makers need to know adapt to what? What can we expect regarding climate? When we're talking about mitigation, same thing. What, what mitigation options are likely to succeed? Now, in both cases, what we need is information on future climate. And for that, the best tools available to establish climate change scenarios, scenarios for future climate, are the climate models, the GCMs. And GCMs, as shown in that little cartoon, they take the world, they divide the world into grids, and then for each grid, they take several layers up into atmosphere and several layers down into the ocean, and following laws of thermodynamics, physics, etc., simulate exchange between these grid cells and simulate global circulation of the atmosphere. In fact, these models are very similar to the ones that I use for weather forecasts, except that the climate scientists modify them to take into consideration changes in the chemical composition of the atmosphere, simulating greenhouse gas emissions. Now, Climate models have become, are becoming better and better. One of the ways in which they become better is they have higher resolution. The earlier models from the first IPCC report, they couldn't see the Alps, they couldn't see the Andes. Now the, the most recent models have much higher resolution, they, they resolve processes much better. But like in any area of science, still a lot to learn. And I'm going to show you an example of the need to continue learning. This graph here shows how the most recent models, including IPCC, the ones that are going to be published next year, how those models are seeing rainfall occurred in a window in Southeast South America during the 20th century. So this is models simulating what happened. And, and that band, that pink band includes all the runs of all the models and basically what they're saying is that in the 20th century, in that window of Southeast South America, rainfall increased more or less five millimeters per month. 
That's how models see reality. This is what happened. So completely different. The observed was much higher than what any of the models were able to do. And that's all right. This is part of advances in science. So one limitation when trying to create future climate scenarios with the models is first, we still need to learn a lot more about climate. Another challenge, probably even more important, is that we have to imagine the world for the next 100 years. We have to imagine how, what will be the level of emissions of greenhouse gases, population, global population rates, deforestation rates, technologies, very, very difficult to imagine. And so what the climate or what the scientist, scientific community did was to establish a range of possible socioeconomic scenarios. Some are more optimistic and say there's going to be a lot of renewable energy sources, a lot of technology transfer between countries. Some are a lot more pessimistic. And then depending on how optimistic or pessimistic, they establish different trends in emissions of greenhouse gases. So now we have emissions in optimistic scenarios, emissions in very pessimistic scenarios. Then they connect these emissions of greenhouse gases with those climate models and establish a prediction for the rest of the century. And you get the classical figure. This is a figure that will be published next year in IPCC report. And it's showing what uh, the different models are predicting for two contrasting scenarios. Again, one that is optimistic and one that is pessimistic. In short, what this model says is that by the end of the century, the global temperature, this is the temperature of the whole planet, not, not the temperature of a region, but the whole planet. The, the global temperature will range anywhere between about one degree warmer than today and about six degrees warmer than today, which is equivalent to say that the price, for example, of oil, of a barrel of oil, by the end of the century will be somewhere between $100 per barrel and $2,000 per barrel. Huge range. Now, this is for temperature. For precipitation, the situation is much more challenging. Uncertainties are bigger. For example, even in, a, in an area like East Africa, where 90% of the moles agree that the region will become wetter, look what happened with the individual runs. So yes, 90% of the models show increase in rainfall, but the range, actually, the range of all the runs are from minus 10 to plus 25. And the interesting thing is that each one of these scenarios have the same chance of occurring. So, and this is for big windows. This is for the whole East Africa. Very few decision makers, policy makers, act at that huge region level. They act at local level. If you try to do predictions at local level, uncertainties are huge, are much larger than this. This is the state of the art. This is the best tools we have to produce climate change scenarios. So in conclusion, climate change scenarios with the best tools we have are uncertain. And in fact, the original objective of IPCC working in climate models and in climate scenarios was not to be connected to impact studies. The main objective was to raise awareness, to say in the 90s, start saying in the 90s, we better change the way we do business or we will be in trouble. But in spite of that, still you see published results, results like this. Results in which they show maps, for example, saying that by the end of the 21st century, Brazil will be producing 10% less corn. And if you go to the pixel, it probably say 12.5% less corn. Now, remember where this is coming from. This is coming from linking some kind of crop models with these climate scenarios, huge ranges. Where is the uncertainty in this map of projected crop yields? No uncertainties. So the problem is that this is not only inappropriate, it's dangerous. Because this is a lot easier to understand by a policy maker, a decision maker,
than a complicated graph showing uncertainties and ranges of possible situations. And because it's easily understandable, they can lead to maladaptation. And I don't know if this term exists. I, I will start using it today, mal mitigation too. So this is the situation. The situation today is that on the one hand, as Bruce was saying, decision makers, including those in charge of policy, have to act in the immediate term, weeks up to maybe a few years. On the other hand, the scientific community have been providing scenarios that are very long, very far in the future, end of the 21st century. And therefore, climate change is perceived as a problem of the future. And then when those decision makers start, under, start understanding better what these climate scenarios come from, they realize they're extremely uncertain. So this is the best recipe for paralysis. You provide information that is very far in the future, and you provide information that is very uncertain. And, and the consequence is that with very few exceptions, you will, you will not see climate change effectively incorporated into development plans, programs, policy, etc. That's, that's the situation today. Clearly, we need new approaches. We need new tools. And just to start with an example, the, the first thing is we, we have to understand that climate varies at very different temporal scales. And I'll show you the example of the Sahel in Africa. So this graph is showing the total annual rainfall observed since 1900s, observing the Sahel year after year, total millimeters of rainfall. One question that we may want to ask is, has there been any climate change in the Sahel? Is there any trend, observed trends in rainfall? And there is a trend, a trend that suggests that uh, in the Sahel now is raining less than it used, was raining at the beginning of the 20th century. That trend is, has a magnitude of about 180 millimeters total in the whole century. Now, if you also look at the graph, you will see that some years rainfall is higher than normal, and some group of years rainfall is below normal. So there are decades that are wetter and decades that are drier. That's the decadal climate variability. And if you Look at the magnitude of that decadal variability. It's already pretty much stronger, much higher than the trend. So it's about 290 millimeters in a couple of decades. And on top of that, you have the year-to-year -year variability, the huge, the huge changes from one year being dry to one year having drought, uh, floods. That's what's called the interannual variability, and that's where the the magnitude is the largest. And if you try to explain what, what part of the whole story is explained by each one of these different temporal variabilities, you will see that 55% of the story is in the year-to-year -year variability. In this case, in the Sahel, that has a strong decadal variability, there is 27% of the story explained by that. And what we usually call climate change, the trend, that's only 18% of the story. Now, this is for the Sahel. In general, in the world, you have about 65% or more explained by the year-to-year -year variability, about 20% in the decadal variability, and only about 15% explained by the trend. And, and think about it. Most of the studies that we see are dealing with this trend. So they are missing 85% of the story. So, a few initial thoughts. The, the scenarios that are based exclusively on climate models are uncertain, they're worse for, for precipitation, and they're much worse for the scale, for the spatial scale that decision makers need. The scenarios that focus only in trends, in what we usually call climate change, they miss very critical information. Imagine in, in adaptation, it's evident, but also imagine in mitigation. We, we plan a mitigation intervention and activity thinking of, the, for example, carbon sequestration for the next 50 years. It may be a forest, it may be grasslands. And then 
in the middle of that period, you have a huge fire, or you have two or three years consecutive droughts. The entire effort in mitigation is destroyed. So focusing only in trends, not only you're missing the big part of the, of the story, but you also may be not, uh, maybe hampering all the efforts that you're trying to make for the longer term. And then the majority of variability is found in this year-to-year -year interannual variability. So we need a different approach, a complementary approach. First of all, we need to place climate change as a problem, as a challenge of the present, not as a challenge of the future something that is already happening. And this is important to bring to the policy agenda. Two, some of the most important uh, challenges or problems dealing with uh, climate change are expected in the increased year-to-year -year variability. That means increased frequency or intensity of extreme events or damaging events like droughts, floods, storms. And therefore, one good way to start improving adaptation to future possible climate is to improve adaptation to current climate. There's a lot to be done still, especially in the developing world, to improve adaptation to current climate variability. With respect to mitigation, also activities should be planned considering all these temporal scales and not only the trend of climate change. Because of what we just said, some of these uh, efforts can be seriously challenged by short-term climate variability. And then, of course, there are some activities that require planning in the future, require some information on future scenarios. But first of all, we don't need to go to the 2100s. No decision maker is interested in 2100. Second of all, let's uh, use an approach that is trying to adapt with flexibility. The truth is that we don't know what the climate will look like in the future. That's the truth. We have an idea, we have models that can help us to imagine some poss possibilities, but it makes sense to adapt with flexibility. Propose a range of plausible, well-informed climate scenarios for the future, and then identify interventions that will be most likely to succeed. So, final comments. Climate risk management and adaptation to climate change. First of all, start improving adaptation to future climate by improving adaptation to current climate variability. There's a lot that can be done learning to adapt to current climate. And then adapt with flexibility. Propose a wide range of plausible climate change scenarios and identify interventions with the highest chance of success. Same thing for mitigation. Mitigation also requires climate information, also requires consideration of climate risks, and therefore also mitigate with flexibility. Same thing. Propose a wide range of possible climate change scenarios and identify interventions in mitigation with high chance of success. And finally, decision makers use a holistic approach. They don't look at one aspect of the uh, issue they're trying to solve. So incorporate climate information, products, and tools into decision systems that integrate this climate information with all the other sectorial information. Thank you. Thanks, Walter. So we, we won't have questions now. We'll keep them until the end. Uh, next speaker is Christine Paddock, Director of the Livelihoods Program at C4, based in Indonesia. Thanks very much, Bruce. Um, I would like to point out that I'm actually presenting on behalf of Miguel Pinedo Vasquez, who unfortunately at the last minute couldn't be here. But I'm also presenting on behalf of that large group of people that you see, whose names you see here, and I'm somewhere pretty far down the list. Um, and these, this was a, a group of um, largely distinguished scientists. Um, 
who work together, all of them either connected with Columbia University and or C4, and many of them um, connected with both, a project that was done on fires in the Western Amazon. So I'm going to be speaking largely and presenting some data largely from that project. And um, quite frankly, I wouldn't choose an anthropologist to present some of this stuff on vegetation and and, and predicting um, the probability of fires, but that's what you've got. But on the other hand, there many of those other people are sitting here as well, so the chances of you're getting a real answer to your questions, if you do ask a question, is probably pretty good. Okay, so um, these are, I'm going to speak, and again, very briefly about many, uh, about uh, these um, important, I think, and, and, um, and interrelated question, uh, uh, issues that, um, the project dealt with, but um, not just, you know, I'd like my, to make comments not just about this specific project in the Western Amazon and the Peruvian Amazon, but I think many of these, it raises issues that are really um, applicable to many other areas. So um, just touch very briefly on the fact that many tropical areas are experiencing profound and rapid landscape change. Um, that some of these changes are re resulting in an increased risk of agricultural fires escaping, um, whether we're talking about things that, that may become forest fires, but that usually have their, their um, origin in agricultural fields, that um, the drivers of, of increased fire incidents are complex and interrelated. And then I'll make a few comments about the kinds of tools that have been developed to some extent based on this project, but also using the expertise of these various scientists and their institutions to develop tools that actually can help policymakers and also help communities both adapt to and, and um, uh, mitigate climate, the effects of climate change, especially as has to do with fire. So there are landscape transitions. This is not new to to most of you, um, that you know, when we talk very, very often, you know, forests being cut for, in this case, in, in the Latin American case, often for pastures, for various kinds of agricultural uses, also for, um, for uh, industrial uh, plantations in this case. Oil palm, these are the kinds of things that are going on the Western Amazon, they're going on in many other places or there are, there are counterparts of these kinds of changes in other places. But um, also, uh, and I think one of the things that the project was interested in and, and that we found were important was not just deforestation as such, but the fact that there were different patterns that were, that were arising. So um, if you look on the, the large thing on the, the, the left, um, that, that's not just a forest. It's a, it's a complex mosaic, a complex smallholder mosaic that includes both agricultural, small-scale agricultural uses, um, lots of managed forests, some, some pastures and so forth. And me, very often what's happening is that patterns, these sort of mosaics are becoming much coarser, so the areas are getting bigger, um, the areas of production are getting bigger, the areas of forest are often getting bigger, There's uh, protected areas are replacing these, these very finely patterned mosaics. In any case, and often also what you find is that tenure changes, you know, and there are larger landowners and there are larger, um, uh, there are different kinds of uses and different types of settlement and, um, different numbers of people on the ground and all that are happening. And so this project actually looked at um, quite a number of these issues, but looks more, most specifically at fire. And fire is, um, fire is interesting because it tends to integrate a lot of changes, um, changes in um, the incidence of fire, of the incidence of fires escaping, for instance, often reflect different kinds of changes. Um, uh, just very briefly, it's in these humid areas, it's not necessarily a natural phenomenon, but people have been using fire for a very long time. It's a very convenient, it's a cheap tool for smallholders to use. Um, and they have been using it for a long time, as I said, um, but there are many things that are happening now, whether climate change, um, Miguel mentions climate change, but there are many other changes that are going on that have changed 
how fire can be used, how effectively fire can be used, and and whether it's and whether it becomes destructive or not. One one one. Well, we'll talk about some of these things, but for instance, there are different de there are demographic changes that are occurring as well, and this. Um, the particular sizes and all of those things don't really matter, but there are multiple dimensions of change that are going on in these landscapes and in many landscapes, and they're really changing the risk of fire, the risk of fires escaping, for example. Um, looking on the right, I mean, the land cover dimensions are things that you might imme immediately uh, think about not only are there different land uses or different land covers, uh, but they often are of different sizes. So pastures are larger, there are larger plantations, the um, new kinds of vegetation coming in in many places, um, and uh, but oh, and also the 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 um, climatic dimensions. The um, you know this is where the climate change issue comes in. Droughts. Um, longer dry periods, um, um, more, more, more um, larger changes with seasonality, different types of variability. But it's also important, I think, to look on the left on a lot of demographic changes that are going on, demographic and, and economic changes. So many more people going into cities, for example. Um, fewer people often actually living in rural areas, um, uh, a lot of the landowning becoming sort of absentee landlords, not just very large ones, but also uh, house, many households becoming multi-local. So much of the time they're actually in the city and there are fewer people out in the countryside and also there's, there's, um, there's, there are a large number of changes going on that, um, it, uh, so it's not just climate change itself and fire, off, fire somehow integrates this fire often shows you the multiple, um, sort of pull, puts all these changes together and, uh, and actually what we find are not only some very interesting changes that are going on in the fire risk and the incident of, of um, escaped fires, but often these are somewhat unexpected and often the relationships are not linear. So I'm just going to show you a few of these what I think are really interesting things that have come out of these papers. And I, um, as I said, I'm not quite ready to, to, to describe it in great detail. But certainly one of the things that was a bit of a surprise to us was that um, where populations were declining, we actually saw more fire. Um, the people may have thought that with people using fire, um, if you had more people, you had more fire, but actually it was sort of the fewer people you had, yeah, there was more fire. And this map of um, the Peruvian Amazon, the, the, the cooler colors actually show declining populations. And these are populations, uh, I think the population figures use the national censuses over the last 30 years. So it's actually in those areas where populations are declining that you're actually seeing more fire. The red shows sort of more fire. Um, um, so this we found a somewhat interesting issue and of course one that could sort of feed upon itself and a lot of it we we believe uh, I, um, you know, in some cases this is somewhat speculative in some cases not that a lot of it has to do with issues for instance of absentee landlords of much larger areas that are being farmed and being farmed with just uh, being used with and leaving only a few guards on in, in the areas where people no longer have the social relations, for example, that makes having your fire escape from your own area a real, a real problem. So people, um, whereas people probably didn't want their agricultural fires to, to escape and burn the next guy's uh, field over, but um, the fact that you were just a guard for a landlord and were, you weren't about to risk your life trying to put fires out whereas the, a, a, an actual owner would have been much more apt to do so. And then with more and more fires, uh, people actually leave because it becomes more difficult to stay on the land and to maintain agricultural uh, production. Another very interesting thing, and I'm going to try my very best to, to actually dis uh, to, to discuss this in a, in a coherent manner, um, we actually looked at, developed statistical models 
that tried to assess the effect of different land covers and the age of different land covers on the probability that particular areas would burn. Um, and here what you see that um, if you look at some of the vegetation, so the first dot on the left you see are degraded pastures. The second one is sort of regular pastures, not really degraded. Then, and then there's sort of increasing um, age of different kinds of vegetation, so younger fallows and then uh, secondary forests. So you see really degraded pastures and secondary forests actually decrease the probability of, um, of, of fires occurring, whereas pastures and young fallows actually increase the probability that fires will occur. On the other hand, so it's sort of a U-shaped curve, right? So the, the, with age, with age of vegetation, it first rises and then falls. On the other hand, if you look at oil palm, um, you get actually a decrease in probability with age. So young oil palm tends to, to areas tend to, um, tend to burn much more, are much more probable that they'll burn uh, young ones being sort of zero to five years old than adolescent ones of about five to 10. And then adult oil palm actually seems to sort of stop fires to some extent. Not, it, however, this is in normal years. If you get a real drought, and in the last decade we've had maybe three years of really extreme drought, things really change. So, um, if there's a drought, things are really apt to burn. I mean, this really influences the, the situation of whether it's gonna burn or not. And if you combine that drought with degraded, um, with degraded pastures, all of a sudden it's no longer less apt to burn, it's actually more apt to burn. And with greater age, you actually see the probability rising rather than that U-shaped curve, right? So. Um, uh, a, a secondary forest, an older secondary forest, makes it even more, more, is even more apt to burn than the other one. There's sort of more fuel or whatever in there. However, if you look at adult, so, so there's that curve. However, if you look at adult oil palm, the probability falls again. There's a real tipping point there and the probability falls. Um, um, we don't know exactly why that's the case. Um, how much it has to do with that particular kind of vegetation, how much it has to do with people really getting out there and stopping fires if you've got an adult oil palm plantation that you really want to save. But these are some of the interesting, maybe um, by us not really predictable um, uh, effect, uh, results that we got and also sort of interesting sort of non-linearities um, um, that we found. If, if I, I may just, one other um, issue I'd like to talk about, and this is, uh, this again, uh, sort of relates some of, the, some of the research we did to the policy issues. Um, essentially, what we found is that, um, and it was, it was truly not my research, but this is Katja Fernandez and Walter's research, sh showed that it's actually uh, possible for us to predict, it's IRI's work, it's actually possible for us to predict uh, bad fire seasons about three months in advance by monitoring um, sea surface temperatures in the North Atlantic. Um, so it's, this actually gives, when we talk about, you know, uh, useful time scales, this gives a three month um, warning that, partic that particular areas are going to, f uh, to suffer um, particular climatic or, or weather um, effects that will make fires much more predictable. So exactly how policymakers can use that, um, you know, we haven't explored all of the, that issue, but there, there, it is possible to predict, and it's possible to predict it with, with quite uh, good accuracy. This shows from 2010, um, um, our ability, each one of these pixels as, as far as, each one of these dots as far as I understand actually shows successful prediction. Um, most of the white places were not areas that we were particularly interested in, but it was, we actually managed to successfully predict three months in advance um, whether there would be um, uh, increased fire season, and there really were increased fires in these areas. So um, just to sum up, um, this particular team, this, 
this um, um, uh, collaboration between the Earth Institute at Columbia University and C4 has been developing both science and tools that can serve both for mitigation, stopping fires, and also for adaptation by, for instance, things like des designing early warning systems for adaptation to climate variability, by providing institutional support to, um, to local government and all for fire prevention, by mapping the vulnerability um, that, that um, the communities would suffer based not only on the climate, but also on various social and demographic and, and economic changes and landscape changes, vegetational changes that have happened. And then, um, and all this can serve to design land cover management strategies to combine both the mitigation and adaptation um, issues and the, especially as has to do with um, a fire risk in these transitional landscapes. And with that, I thank you on behalf of Miguel Pinedo and the whole group. Thanks very much. Uh, the third speaker is uh, Shahid Nahim. Uh, he's the Director of Science uh, for the Center for Environmental Research and Conservation at the Earth Institute as well. So where would it be? <laughs> What's that? Close that? I think so. Yep. Close this one down. Okay. And close. Yep. All right. Oh, there we are. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for... Um, for coming, it's really great, to, great fun to be here. I, I think I'm learning a lot um, that I don't get to, to learn when I'm um, uh, focusing so much on the science. I'm a scientist, I feel I should apologize for that. I'm actually representing um, uh, quite a number of uh, people at different institutions, and they're all listed down below. And CERC actually involves the American Museum of Natural History, the New York Botanical Garden, Wildlife Conservation Society, and, and, and more, and then our department. So collectively, we, we uh, represent uh, uh, people from NGOs, people who are practitioners, people who are um, students, um, uh, and um, uh, professors, instructors, and it's, it's quite a wide range of people who, who work on this topic. Now, I was asked to speak about biodiversity, and um, um, I was told to talk about ecosystem services and biodiversity, functional biodiversity and climate change, and bioecological adaptation. Um, and I was told I had 12 minutes um, to do this. So um, I'll try to, try to stick the, to the time, um, but you'll see that I'm going to take some shortcuts. Um, okay, so why does biodiversity matter? Um, I'm just going to borrow from the Millennium Assessment. After all, there was uh, uh, 1,300 people who worked for five years, and they didn't agree on a lot, but the one thing they did agree on was that biodiversity was the foundation for ecosystem functioning, which is what you know, we as biogeochemists or ecosystem ecologists would study. But then that's linked to ecosystem services, and that takes us into the realm of social sciences, um, which I'm you know, less uh, uh, familiar with, as opposed to Christine, who was just up here. And then that is linked to human well-being. So if we've all settled on that, that biodiversity matters, it's somewhat surprising to me that it actually doesn't appear very often um, uh, when we're talking about climate change. And there's been 20 years of research. I had the privilege of being able to write a, a review paper on it to celebrate 20 years of this research on the importance of biological diversity. There was a study done a little while ago that actually looked at the impact of all of the research that we've done for 20 years on policy, on the media, and on other sorts of uh, places outside of our science, and the impact was almost zero. <laughs> so imagine doing something for 20 years, and you're all excited about it, and they say, what's the impact? And somebody says, it's zero. And you're thinking, well, maybe we as scientists need to do something differently. So I really enjoyed being able to interact with people who are much more on the, on the ground and, and advancing the science. Because this is how we view it, and the scientists actually have this very complex view in which we're looking at how uh, three and a half billion years of evolution has generated 8.7 million species that are generated that are found in biomes all around the world. But we know that these biomes and these ecosystems are changing, and that affects biogeochemistry.
it's hard to actually hold that model in one's mind when thinking about uh, the world, and even more difficult if you're trying to figure out what to do as someone who's designing policy or who's a manager. Um, but that's what's in the head of a scientist. And we do actually link it to anthropogenic drivers, but sometimes it doesn't um, come out as very clear. So I'm going to give you five scientific studies just because I wanted to show you that I'm a scientist, and I'm doing that first with a rotating three-dimensional graph, which is absolutely inscrutable. But the message is actually pretty clear. Um, if you look at the, American, um, the North American Great Plains, which once had natural vegetation and bison, it's now 99% agriculture. And what we did is we looked at the capacity for native vegetation to deal with environmental change using functional diversity, as opposed to taxonomic diversity and agricultural diversity. And if you look at that little blue, that little blue shape at the bottom, that represents the kind of functional diversity that's left in the agricultural systems that are there, and that large green sphere is what the prairie could do. Now, of course, the prairie wasn't very edible, but it actually had the capacity to deal with a tremendous amount of environmental change. This paper was just accepted last week, but here, this is two of five, so bear with me. I know people don't like science so much, but I, I, I enjoy it so much, I, I want to share it with you. And um, um, what we wanted to show here is that, you know, 85% of the species, or more, You've never seen, I've never seen, they've not been described, many of them are microbes or insects or tiny things, and they're rare plants. And what we showed, at least for plants, was that rare species actually have a lot in common with common species. So if you lose the common species, those rare species represent a great source of biological insurance. But we actually able to try to show that in a mechanistic way. This paper we published in 2005 that showed, you know, forests store carbon, but biodiverse forests store more carbon and store it more reliably. And we were concerned about a lot of sort of policy or lots of ideas about carbon credit, which wasn't looking at the diversity of the forest and giving the sort of credit that was there. Simple message, complex story. Um, this one here is just to show that right now in my discipline, everybody is moving to multiple dimensions of biodiversity. But the field of biodiversity seems to be dominated by looking at how many species there are and adding them up, which is very primitive biodiversity science. But taxonomic diversity and number of species doesn't tell you much about what the, what's happening in the real world. Biodiversity is multi multiple dimensional. In this study here, which is published in Ecology, we're showing that ecosystem functions are actually better predicted by phylogenetic diversity and functional diversity. Taxonomy doesn't tell you very much, and yet most of biodiversity policy and most of biodiversity conservation is focused on taxonomy. This last one is a paper by Erica Zavaleta, and there are many more like this. It's been published in 2009. It makes a simple point that, you know, a lot of times we're talking about carbon storage or pollination or, you know, water uh, production. But when you do that one study at a time, you get a false sense that it doesn't take much biodiversity for you. What these graphs are showing is that if you have multiple functions you're trying to preserve or trying to manage, um, it takes a lot more diversity. And if you want to get a lot of those functions, if you want only 30% of each of the functions, it doesn't take as much diversity, although it gets quite high when you want lots of functions. But if you want lots of functions, and you want at least half of those functions, and that could be soil um, uh, um, uh, production or nutrient retention or water production, you need an exponential amount of diversity to get that. So this business of looking at one function or one service at a time doesn't work. So there, in, in, you know, is, is, is five studies which I would have loved to have spent about an hour on each, but I just did it that quickly. So here's the problem. I realized that for 20 years our science hasn't had much impact. And it's because we don't have simple messages. And yet the message is fairly simple. If you keep losing spices, eventually curry is salt. I thought since I was coming from, from Poland, I should get the Polish sausage. And if you say, if you keep losing spices, eventually you just have fat. Um, but, you know, it's a fairly simple message, right? And those complicated studies, the five that I sh just showed you, actually, this is the bottom line. And I think that almost anybody, whether they're a policymaker or a private citizen or a manager, can get that. If you keep losing parts, eventually all of you have all you have is junk. Okay, now this is sort of like the brain, and I have to say that you know with the jet lag, I'm worrying I've lost a lot of parts. But I think everybody knows that when you start to lose the parts, all you get is junk, right? And that's the same that's true for our ecosystems. Now it gets so much harder to get that message across when we look at a complex landscape. This is a beautiful landscape. It's quite a mosaic of natural habitats and managed habitats, and it's quite a range. But what we want to say is if you keep losing species, eventually ecosystems collapse. And that's what 20 years of research has been arguing for. 
Um, so here, we can expand it. But, um, you know, ecosystems become less efficient. They exhibit lower levels of function. They deliver fewer services. They become less reliable. Um, they're less resilient. And eventually, the pillars of human well-being decline, with the poor and vulnerable being the first to experience the adverse consequences of biotic impoverishment. Those seem to me very important things to consider and not actually that difficult to, 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 um, to deal with from a policy or management level. Now, we are looking at a landscape because we're trying to integrate across the agricultural and the non-agricultural systems. So now with the Sustainable Development Goals replacing the Millennium Development Goals, um, we've, you know, the United Nations has set up the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. I'm excited about that because one people could complain about the Millennium Development Goals is that they really didn't have a lot of solutions that they had to the problems of implementing them. So this time the United Nations has actually set up a network, and I encourage you all to look it up and see if you're willing to participate, that when people are trying to meet the Sustainable Development Goals in 2030, that they actually will have a, a, a group that they can turn to to find solutions. And one of the first things we did, which is this complicated diagram, is to say that ecosystems are ecosystems. Doesn't matter if it's agriculture, doesn't matter if it's a rainforest, doesn't matter if it's a prairie or it's a monoculture of, of corn. They all provide services, they all have functions but the proportions of those services are very hard to, um, uh, to keep in balance. As I said, for the, for the, um, the uh, Great Plains, you know, much of the Great Plains is edible. And if it isn't edible, we feed it to cows and then we eat them. But when you go to the natural prairie grassland, there's not a lot that's edible there. But they actually do a lot for, for, for uh, retaining water, for uh, uh, picking up um, uh, uh, organic pollutants and degrading them, and providing many other uh, ecosystem services. So I'm just going to give you the, the few points. Um, I think Lou asked me for six slides, and I gave 18. Um, so I, I'm going to make the, I think he just wanted these last three slides. The message, okay, diverse systems are more efficient and resilient. There's 20 years of research to back that up. And there is a scientific consensus. There's a lot of stuff that's being debated, but there is a scientific consensus. It's not a hypothesis anymore. You know, in America, I see, you know, there's still people think it's a hypothesis that climate is changing. Um, well, this is not so, you know, when it comes to biodiversity. It really does matter if your system becomes more and more simple. Okay, biodiversity is not about species richness. This is a tough one because I think we are so inculcated in the idea of using species as our metric for biodiversity, it's really sort of tough. And it's not about conservation biology. This is a problem I run into all the time. You notice I didn't show a single picture of a beautiful rhinoceros or a resplendent quetzal or, 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 or something like that. I love those things. I spend a lot of time chasing them down. But that's not what biodiversity is about. It's about 8.7 million species, most of which you don't see. Okay, so we need to clarify what biodiversity is and focus on functional, genetic, and landscape diversity. The latter is very tough to measure, but very important. Um, and I think this is my last slide. I think the Convention on Biological Diversity and the UNFCCC create confusion because the Convention on Biological Diversity addresses climate change, but only, indirectly, only in, indirectly. And the framework on climate change um, uh, does not, uh, it has a couple of technical reports about biodiversity, but if you saw that map, I mean, you saw that model that Walter presented at the beginning, I actually met some climate modelers and they said, what do you want? I said, I want you to take that model that now finally has the Alps in it and put 8.7 million species in it. And they said, go away, right? <laughs> because they don't even want to put in 10 species. But that's the kind of complexity we're dealing with, even though the message is fairly simple. I think that, you know, one thing we could do is generate a set of coherent guidelines. I think our group out at Columbia and C4 are, are, are working towards that. And try to provide some sort of cross-cutting, clear guidelines that help understand bioclimatic um, adaptation and mitigation as opposed to just one or the other. I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> I think we almost should give Shahid an extra clap because he's the, he had the biggest agenda and he finished it exactly on time. <laughs> uh, and the last scientific presentation is uh, Ruth DeFries, who's Professor of Sustainable Development, Earth Institute, Columbia.
Okay, thank you. I don't usually do work research on climate adaptation, but that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, climate adaptation, the more we look into it, the more we see that there's so much research to be done on that topic. And we think about landscape approach, who's in the landscape, it's people who are getting their livelihood, growing food, uh, who are adapting to changes in their landscape. So I wanna talk about uh, what we're learning from a data set that CCAFs uh, collected and Bruce provided us the opportunity to analyze and see where we can go with climate adaptation. So when we talk about climate adaptation, it's very local. It's who's really the decision maker on the landscape. It's the people who are managing the landscape every day, the local decision maker, the land manager, and uh, those are the people who are faced with decisions about how to adapt to climate change. So we often have a somewhat mismatch in, in uh, scale when we think about climate adaptation and climate mitigation as well. Uh, we talk way up here at the international policy level or even at the national policy level and the people who are making decisions about how to adapt to change are very much at the local level. So how do we connect this, these scales, this mismatch in scales, which we often find? Part of that is trying to um, improve our understanding about those decisions which really are going on on the ground and how local decision makers, those are the land managers and the farmers, are making decisions about climate adaptation and why they're making those decisions and what factors go into the decisions that they're making. So there is a, uh, a data set that some of you are probably familiar with, uh, collected by CCAFs, which is a really unique data set. Much of the climate adaptation literature is at a very local scale, case studies, uh, single points in time. Uh, CCAF spent quite a bit of effort to collect a baseline household survey across 4,000 households in 12 countries, 83 villages, I think that's the number, uh, to ask the same questions of the farmers and uh, see what we can learn about how they are thinking about adapting to climate change. And that information then can feed up the chain to, uh, to the, the larger scales, thinking about policies to um, promote successful adaptation to climate change. So we analyzed this, uh, this database, large database, again, in 83 different villages across 12 countries to see what we can learn about uh, the decisions at the local scale about adaptation. How general are the conclusions that we can reach across different regions? How, how locally specific uh, are those decisions that are being made? And uh, we, we, we spent some time um, trying to glean out what we can from this very impressive and large effort to collect data across these thousands of households in different parts of the world. So what did we find there? One of the questions that, uh, that this survey was after was to look at how useful is weather and climate information really. Walter told us about uh, how long uh, Climate information on long timescales really is not very useful. The local land manager and farmer is thinking about the, the weather and the crop season and what to do and is really not thinking about climate. Um, we found that in these different re regions, clearly weather information is significantly associated with change, providing information about weather. Uh, does lead to changes. These changes that this survey asked was, uh, was whether the households made some change in their agricultural practices over the last 10 years. Didn't ask uh, 
it, it looked at what type of change, whether the change was in timing of planting, whether the change was in the crop variety, irrigation, different types of land management, and then uh, asked some more information about why those changes were made. It, this data set also, very importantly, does not provide information about whether that change was actually successful or not, whether the outcome was positive, beneficial adaptation or maladaptation, and that's a real issue with the adaptation literature. But what we found when we looked across these different four regions, West Africa, India, East Africa, and, uh, and Bangladesh, that uh, reported change over the, the, the last 10 years, the 10 years in the survey period, was positively associated with weather information. So weather information is providing some useful service. That's good to know because IRI and many institutions spend a lot of effort on providing uh, information about weather. Uh, the mode of delivering that weather information or the Effective mode of delivering that information ranged very widely across these four regions, whether radio, social networks, TV, um, NGOs, different sources of information were very different in these four different regions. So this, this large survey did provide information that the, the weather information does seem to be um, useful information. Good. Uh, but we also see here, which is not a surprise, that climate and weather is one of many, many reasons that smallholder farmers are making changes or reporting changes in their practices. It's, uh, we often think about climate adaptation and climate information in the abstract of what is uh, leading to going into decisions that smallholder farmers are making, but we see here that climate really is less than, less than half of the farmers reported that they were making changes due to, linked with climate, other factors, markets, um, land, um, labor resources, uh, prices, these factors were more important than uh, than climate. So when we think about climate adaptation, it's really important to think about the holistic context in which, uh, in which local land managers are making, uh, making their decisions. So here's a lot of numbers, and I don't want to go into all the numbers, but just to, uh, just to tell you that there, this is a very rich data set uh, that has a lot of information embedded in it. Uh, and that the, these reasons for change vary across, uh, across regions. Uh, in India, for example, the, the percent of farmers who are making changes or reporting that they made, made changes due to climate was, was pretty low, 17% uh, or so, and the main reason was market. In West Africa, climate was a more important factor, although um, still, uh, other factors such as lands and market and so on were, were very important in what went into the, uh, the changes. Also, in different regions, uh, the far smallholder farmers are, um, are making changes based on different aspects of climate, which again gets to Walter's uh, questions about what information is really useful for making decisions. Uh, less rainfall, more rainfall, higher temperatures, um, starts of rains, and so on, uh, are different types of information that, that um, smallholder land uh, farmers are responding to. So the reasons vary uh, across regions, and the types of change vary across regions, improved varieties, timing, land management, fertilizer, and so on. Uh, so, in that data set, there is, as I said, a, a real wealth of information, but what that tells us most importantly is that when we think about providing information and we think about policies to promote uh, climate adaptation, the context for making those decisions is important, and understanding that particular context uh, 
is really needed. So we thinking about policies way up here at the, at the global scale or even the national scale really needs to be um, disassembled to think about what, what would be beneficial at the local scale in different situations. We've also um, taken a look at research on climate adaptation and uh, looking through all of the literature that we can find uh, about where that research is being done and who is conducting that research. And though we all know that the impacts of climate change are likely to be the greatest in the uh, tropics, or are currently, we know, are, are um, significant in the tropics, more important in the tropics than in temperate locations, most of the research, as far as we can see, on the issue of climate adaptation is being done in temperate locations by scientists working in, scientists from um, countries in the temperate part of the world. And this um, is, is really a mismatch to the climate adaptation research that is being done and the need for understanding about uh, climate adaptation. So this is just a, a small set of all the literature, but the more and more we delve into the literature, the stronger this conclusion uh, seems to be. So to sum up, uh, we, uh, we're using the CCAFS data set to understand that climate and weather information is one of many reasons why farmers make changes, and we often forget that <laughs> when we think about climate adaptation approaches, and that the local context is is uh, really essential to formulate policies for both adaptation and mitigation. Um, we can't think about one size fits all kinds of policies. Uh, the regions vary very much and within the regions uh, as well. Uh, we need to understand the local context if we're going to be successful. And we need a research framework that, um, that looks at long-term outcomes. The research as it currently is looks at whether farmers make changes or not. But whether, what's the long-term outcome of that? Is that adapting to climate or is that maladapting to climate? We really don't have the long-term information that we need to assess, uh, assess the outcomes of, of adaptation uh, and the impacts of uh, national and international policy. So again, climate adaptation is not my usual area of research, but this, this data set uh, provides uh, in, uh, a window into the, into the climate adaptation, and it's uh, quite a um, fertile area for research and uh, needs quite a bit more research and attention than, than it's currently getting. So do I have a thank you slide? No, I don't. Okay, thank you. a little bit so we go from four science presentations and now the last presentation is really going to look how how do scientists and policy makers work better together and it's uh, Dr. Romano Kiyomi who's the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Environment Agriculture in Kenya Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Campbell and um, Lou, for inviting me in this, uh, uh, in this forum. Uh, first, I am not a current permanent secretary. I'm former permanent secretary, Minister of Agriculture. I, I moved on uh, three months, six, four months ago uh, as the permanent secretary, Minister of Agriculture. Uh, secondly, it's uh, interesting for me to talk in a forum like this. Mm -hmm. I am actually a natural resource scientist myself. A monitor for that matter, actually monitoring uh, food production sustainability. And uh, I've been a policy maker as a permanent secretary for about eight years, mm -hmm. but it's interesting now to come and talk as a policy maker. So, second, Dandley is um, as a policy maker to talk after four scientists. Uh, they, it's a big difference. I mean, uh, it's a quarter of the time. So you will get that quarter of the feeling. Then you will see scientists talk with the presentations from their uh, uh, laptops. I'll talk with my presentation from my iPad. 
Again, you'll find that we are doing better, but uh, that is how we go. Anyway, for a beginning, I would like to, probably most of my, my presentation will be uh, something you have heard before, but defining it a little bit further. You know, when we talk of policymakers, who are we talking about? Uh, I'm going to talk here as a policymaker because I was a permanent secretary, equivalent to a minister or something like that. But actually, a policymaker has a wide range of people. And that's one of the things that scientists have never grasped. You think when you talk to a cabinet secretary, when you talk to a permanent secretary, uh, you have actually informed the policymakers. So I want to inform you that the range of policymakers range from the executive, that is the president and his cabinet, and uh, the, the, the permanent secretaries, the legislators, that is the lawmakers, and actually they are very important, that's parliamentarians, people who have been elected by the people, presenting the people, and even the lawyers who have a lot to do with uh, making the, the, the policies, and uh, even the media that's got a lot to do with communicating and actually influencing the policy making. So uh, one of the mistakes we'll be doing is not being able to understand who are the policy makers and targeting becomes uh, a problem. Uh, Vandre, I want to make a point that when you talk of a policy, what are we talking about? And many times, scientists and people from the civil society and from uh, uh, um, the, uh, especially the NGO communities, every time somebody from government talks, you think they are talking policy. But they're actually talking politics. Politics is completely different from policy. So you need to look carefully to see what is policy and what is politics. So that, because policy has a longer lasting effect than the politics. And that's why we are also assuming that for policymakers, you need to give them decisions that they will make in the short term. Policies are not actually short term, they are long term. And uh, uh, because they are supposed to last over time and space. So uh, we need to make those, that differentiation, and uh, especially for somebody who was a natural resource scientist, uh, coming from where I came from, and then staying among the people who combined policy and politics for a long time, you find this very interesting. Now, how do the policymakers then use the climate change information? The wide range of policymakers. Now, since we have been targeting the executive in informing them on uh, climate change information, on climate change parameters, we find that a wide range of policymakers actually have no idea of uh, uh, climate change. Uh, for example, in the whole of Africa, at no time has any of the politicians used any climate change uh, 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 lists or uh, problems or issues as a campaign promise. That shows how they actually don't know much about it. Uh, so until we get such kind of situation where uh, okay, for, you know some, some of us come from countries which have had very important policy makers, I mean, uh, politicians who have reached that level, people like the uh, Nobel Olets, Wangari Malai. But tell you frankly, he never used his knowledge of environment and climate change for campaign. He had to use other, she had to use other means, and yet she was such a renowned scientist in terms of uh, 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 environment and uh, matters that you may consider important in climate change. Now, yeah, the policymakers use climate information to make policies, uh, to make laws, 
even to design programs and projects, uh, even to start small institutions. Uh, you will notice that because of a lot of quite important uh, uh, information coming from the international systems, most of the policymakers, most of the, the institutions in the developing world have done something small with the effect to climate change, something like starting a unit or uh, having laws on environment, but basically you may view that as not enough. Yes, they do that, but how much have they done? Um, and one of the reasons is because most of the people, or most of the times, it is only the executive who are informed about climate change matters. And uh, policy makers such as the parliamentarians, who are actually very important in making the laws. And in many countries now, in the developing world, there are even policy makers at uh, uh, lower levels, at county level. Uh, I know many countries have got states now. Other countries have got counties like we have in Kenya. They have governors, they have uh, county assemblies. All those are very important in policy making and probably because they don't, they don't know much about climate change, uh, then you find that climate change does not fight, in a, I mean, it does not fight any uh, position in their programs and activities and in their strategic plans. We have been talking a lot on, in scientific uh, presentations some of the presentations you have heard today, many times they are presented in seminars and workshops and meetings. And in fact, most of the policy makers at that level, they attend most of these seminars and, uh, and, and meetings, maybe as a break, uh, to take a break from their much more intense discussions. And they don't take much of that away with them. So we need to find ways and means of doing things probably in a more serious manner than seminars, uh, workshops, and meetings. Uh, and probably be coming to that a little bit later in suggesting some of the mechanisms that we can use as pathways to getting uh, some of this information into, the, into um, the policies and programs. For example, I think we are all aware that most of uh, the people actually, not only the policy makers, in the developing world, they view climate change, as we've been taught, as a problem of the future. In any case, this is a problem that's been created by the developing, developed world. They are the ones who are emitting carbon, they are the ones who are polluting the environment. And actually, we go to most of the debates are saying, you do something about it, leave us alone. Uh, you cost the mess, so clean the mess. Uh, they say that most of the time, and sometimes they, 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 even when they don't say, it's because they just want to behave nice. Uh, so when you make any of these international laws, they sign the levels of carbon emission that you would want, you, know, you, you, you suggest would not be emitted, and all this kind of things, but do nothing about it. Uh, because, again, there is no uh, monitoring measures, there is no means of, uh, of uh, sanctions and rewards if you do something about it or not. So it becomes just another public relations activity. Uh, we need to get more serious than that. So what do we do? Because to tell you in real sense and having uh, been involved in a lot of these dis discussions in uh, environment and climate change in the developed, developing world. Uh, one of the reasons that they don't hesitate in signing any of these international protocols is because they actually do nothing about it, and whether they sign or not, and uh, uh, whether they, they do something about it or not, nobody does anything about it anyway. So it becomes like, well, 
uh, one of my uh, ministers in environment was very vocal, said it's like a child play. We, we play, we go home, and we, 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 life goes on. There are some times, some cases, where they see real problems, and they take real action. Uh, I keep giving examples of India. I remember visited India in 1984, 85, and by that time, there was so much pollution, there was so much, uh, 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 as pollution of an environment, when you are getting from the hair, but you feel the real smoke of the hair itself. 84, 85, 86, 87. And because they experienced the problem themselves first hand, they actually did something themselves first hand. You go to Derry now and Bobby, and you find green trees planted all along the airport. All cars, by law, are not allowed to emit anything. They all use LPG gas, by law. They made it by law. And I remember at one time I visited India, I think 2007, and we had the opportunity of interacting with the, with the, with the president, not the prime minister, the president, who was, a, he was actually a physicist, uh, a nuclear physicist for that matter. And, uh, you know, presidents are like figures in India, but a very intelligent person. And you could understand why they did the kind of things they did, because the information went all the way from the politicians. Scientists were involved in the decision making. When you have a scientist who is the president, a nuclear face is as the president. You expect a big difference in the decision making that. And therefore, I could be able to understand why they have taken such strong action in India. And yet in other parts of the world, in Africa and other places, they haven't. So what I'm suggesting is that we need to be much more proactive in who we reach. So some of the pathways to, to uh, uh, for scientists to interact with the policymakers is to try to see whether it is possible to have formal mechanisms of briefing and uh, scheduling meetings with a cross section of the policymakers, ranging all the way from the executive to the legislature to the uh, lower levels of government. Formal, not seminars and workshops and meetings. Uh, the other mechanism is possibilities of having professional bodies who, who take climate change as a matter of a regular subject. We have professional bodies in various, I mean various uh, professions, but I'm not aware of any strong professional bodies that deal with climate change, that have climate change as a formal subject or a formal agenda in a, profe in a professional body. It's very important to look at how or where it would be possible to have scientists get involved themselves in policy. Uh, there's a lot of matter, there's a lot of difference when uh, the person involved in making those decisions at the various levels are scientists uh, compared to when they are not. At the international level, it would be important to see whether it is possible to establish mechanisms for the ones and sanctions with respect to, <clears throat> to application of climate change uh, interventions. Uh, I mean, for example, there is the World Food Prize, there is the various prices which are offered in the world, I mean, in the various regions. Uh, one would want to look at the possibilities of uh, of prices at various levels for actions which have been taken at international level and uh, uh, creating environments or creating situations that give people incentive to participate in climate change actions. Uh, like now we have a few actions like uh, payment for environmental services, but I don't think they have been taken very seriously in payments for environmental services or for climate change and interventions and adaptation issues. Now, uh, if you look at most of the information that is provided by scientists, it's relatively scientific. Uh, 
And many of the policymakers want simple, succinct information so that they can use it at policymaking levels. So it may be important to find ways and means of um, kind of producing simple messages that can be taken easily by the uh, policymakers at the various levels. Uh, to conclude, I would want to make the following statements. In Africa, typically only the executive are informed about climate change matters. The registrars, the uh, public, and many other stakeholders are not informed, and therefore very little is, uh, is done in terms of uh, uh, adaptation and mitigation. In any case, while they may take a few adaptation actions, they view mitigation as something that should be left to those actually who caused the problem, and therefore there is very little mitigation activities we can say would be taken on climate change matters. Uh, as I've mentioned before, most of the mechanisms to inform the policymakers are informal, and unless we have formal mechanisms of information, informing policymakers, then we don't expect much of the information that you are moving around uh, enters into policy making, programs, and projects. I would want to, again, detaliate the need for scientists working along the whole value chain of the policymakers uh, so that they can prioritize activities and interventions of climate change for, especially, I mean, for the policymakers. Because as it is now, the threat to climate change or the threat to livelihoods of people is seen more strongly by the scientists than the policymakers. And that needs to be addressed. So the proposed approach, it is proposed as scientists in this forum discuss mechanisms and interventions that would enter into uh, international and the national policies through more of strong policy, state, mean policy issues such as registration. Because I, I want to mention or to inform you that most of the policies, when they are in form of uh, policy statements or they are in form of uh, uh, programs and projects, do not really end up being of much impact until a specific policy is converted into law, then we, we, it really does not um, uh, become very effective. We, we, uh, I, we believe or I know that the most effective policy statement or policy is the one that's been converted into law and therefore it's important to take every policy statement, every information that we, we provide uh, uh, for this uh, purpose of climate change to see whether it, goes, it gets into the laws of the various uh, I mean, uh, uh, national and even uh, uh, rural government systems. Uh, I'll stop there and uh, thank you very much for your attention. So I'd like to invite the speakers up to the stage. And so we can throw it up into the audience for comments or questions. Uh, I'll just tell you one story. Is, is, um, is that CCAPS is really committed to having outcomes and linking better with uh, the policy makers, the decision makers, the people who are having action on the ground. And so we decided to put one of our senior scientists this year for four months into IFAD, which is the International Fund for Agricultural Development, which has got a billion dollar per annum investment, to understand how science products can better inform the policies of IFAD. So this is not national government, this is a multilateral agency. And it was really interesting experience. Because this, uh, and you need a special sort of scientist to be able to put there in the first place, of course. Uh, and we, we unfortunately have got a special one, and she, she's my right-hand person, so I lost her for four months, which was a great tragedy for my own workload. But she did a fantastic job in working with IFAD. And uh, some of the quotes that came out were that the decisions are made at the speed of light and that scientists are just not ready to, to rise to the challenge of making decisions like this. 
that, that uncertain and, and, and not 100% great scientific information is better than waiting for four months for the better information if you want to I impact the rolling out of programs. Another one was that they need the scientists more than they need the science. In other words, they need the advisors who are, the, who are doing the science, but they're actually not so interested in the science. They want the person to provide them the data. Tools, they weren't so happy about tools. They wanted people who were playing around with those things and to give them the advice. They didn't want to be handed tools which they had to deal with. So these were lots of interesting things to, to, for us to think about how we do science better and impact the process. Questions from the audience? And perhaps you could s say your name and then uh, and your institution and then fire off your question or your comment. I'm going to ask for a few questions, so panelists, please try and remember them. And I notice you haven't got a pen, so I bet you've got a good memory. <laughs> lack uh, in alternatives. And the second question would be also with regard to this, is if you also ask the people uh, with regard to the use of any traditional forecast methods, for example, uh, um, um, behavior of insects or something like this. Thank you. Okay, and we'll have a third one over there. But you're not allowed to ask Ruth. And I'll just throw a challenge out to you all. Um, Edmund de Barrow, I work with IUCN. Um, there's a lot about science and research with, on climate change. Are you, C4, um, Earth Institute, starting to learn anything from some of those people who live with risk as a daily part of their lives? For example, in some of the drier areas where I've experienced within Africa, I've certainly learned more about risk management and resilience, some of the key components of climate change adaptation, from pastoralists that I've learned from any learned textbook of climate change, et cetera, et cetera, which goes to build on the bit of the previous question. That's all for now. I've got another question later on. <laughs> 
One last question before we all. Here we are. One more over there. Excuse me. <laughs> Hello, thanks everyone for your talks. Ross Hampton, I'm the Chief Executive of the Australian Forest Products Association. I used to work in the Australian Government, now I work on the Australian Government and I, I love those presentations and uh, I'm not a scientist. I just wanted to ask a question I think that goes to the title of the talk about these temporal ranges and the difference between science and policy making. And I think woven through all the presentations is, is a, and some of the slides which I took photos of and I just loved is grappling with this difficulty of, of the way that the policy makers deal with the questions in front of them as opposed to the scientists. In Australia we've had some developments lately that suggest uh, and have been comments made by our Prime Minister amongst others that we're not going to do climate change dressed up as something else or climate change mitigation adaption dressed up as something else. So is there a goal to, in your work, to try to simplify, if you like, the science to the message, to the, to the real elephant in the room, the climate change elephant? Good. So perhaps we can start with Ruth. Okay. Um, on the, uh, how the questions were asked, uh, this is, I, uh, a question maybe Bruce can answer because it was CCAPS that really coordinated this, uh, this survey and the collection of this data, a very large effort. But I believe that the reasons were categorically provided rather than open-ended, which I think such a large data set it would be very difficult to, <laughs> to um, deal with open-ended uh, questions. So I think they were categorical, uh, I believe. Bruce might have, have more to say on that. Uh, about the reliability of information, that's really a, uh, a key aspect that we pulled out of this, because uh, CCAPS asked us to provide feedback on what could be useful in future uh, surveys, is uh, we know whether the farmers reported change. We don't know whether they had better yields, or they had worse yields, or the climate inf weather information was useless or whether it was useful. So that's a really um, key aspect, which is another um, sort of data collection aspect, which is uh, it, it's a layer on top of all of, all of that. Uh, traditional uh, knowledge about, uh, about making forecasts, yeah, that was m most certainly part of the uh, part of the survey. I, I don't remember exactly the numbers. They weren't enormous in terms of farmers reporting make, making changes on the basis of that information, but I can go back and, and look at those numbers. But it was, it was definitely in there. So I have, uh, is this working? Yeah. Uh, my comment on, on, on your comment on whether now we are repackaging adaptation and, and doing work on actual development. I think this is, is part of sort of like a pendular history, right? Because I, I was thinking now, how many years did we miss by asking for additionality? How many opportunities did we miss because we had to show that what we were proposing was in addition to what we, we were supposed to do. Uh, I feel terrible about that, terrible. And so, uh, I, the way I see it now is that I cannot envision development plans that do not consider adaptation to climate change. I, I find it very hard to separate it. But if I have to choose between the two extremes of the pendulum, I'll choose doing what we're supposed to do in the name of adaptation. Uh, the, the other question that I found interesting is on, on whether we should simplify the messages. And, and I, think, I think, yes, we, we should simplify the messages as much as possible. Although I think that the, the most effective way to transfer knowledge is not necessarily having a scientist talking to a policymaker. I mean, these are interesting exercises. 
But I think that the, the, at least in our, in our experience, the, the, the real successful stories uh, occur when we have a, a chain of information, a network of information. We, you have scientists talking to maybe more applied scientists who are talking to advisors, like our colleague was saying, who are informing decision makers. And the truth is that there are very few scientists that can talk directly to a farmer or to a minister. And, and it's fine. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I just think that if we really want science informing decisions at the farmer or at the ministerial level, we need to strengthen those networks of knowledge transfer. And, and not necessarily skip links and have scientists trying to talk to a farmer or to a minister. And I think very often we overlook that. Very often we, we have uh, scientists trying to talk to, to the press or trying to talk to a minister, and, and typically it's a disaster. <laughs> the, the truth is that we need these intermediary links. And, and so uh, I think just Sometimes it makes a lot of sense to have very, very simple messages and, and some scientists are able to do it directly. I think a more sure strategy is to strengthen these chains or networks of knowledge. Anybody else from the panel want to rise to the challenge of uh, Ed's one that he, he learns more from the people in the field than the scientists? <laughs> Christine? Sure, I'm an anthropologist, sort of what I do for a living, or I pretend to do for a living. No, I, I think there is an enormous area of finding out how people do adapt, you know, um, and that takes every, you know, and, and it takes us in, in directions that sometimes I think we overlook. Um, migration and all is not a sign of, of not of maladaptation. Often often there are traditional forms of change of residence, mobility. There are many, many different just the, the simple flexibility, the the diversity that tends to make up sort of of, of um, local portfolio livelihood portfolios and all. There's so many of these things that that I think we can see as as sources of adaptation and I think often are not described that way. Um, so I, I do fear very much, you know, once everybody really takes adaptation to heart and then it's gonna teach all those guys how to adapt, you know. Um, I, I fear that there's going to be a lot of, um, uh, we're going to be working uh, in ways that are not going to be useful to people. So I think the, the um, necessity of finding out how people adapt, and th but this isn't easy, you know. I mean, it's it's um, it's not always just a matter of going and, and and going with a questionnaire and saying, do you you know, you know, pick three out of four of the you know, are these the most imp important area ways of adaptation? A lot of it has to do with kinship networks, with all kinds of social networks. I think we miss we we underestimate the importance of a lot of that already um, uh, so yes it's it's time to, um, to to look at that very very seriously and not to look at and, and also not to separate that traditional stuff you know we want the traditional on one side and then we want this new improved stuff on the other people have been changing those traditional forms for a long time yeah I, I want to bring out a point of uh, making messages that are useful to the policymakers and some mechanisms of doing that. Uh, while we know that maybe scientists are not the best placed in terms of expressing themselves to politicians, to, to policymakers, and to those levels, I want to give you a few examples of scientists who have been very successful. We are all aware that Norman Borog said that many times that he has to walk on the corridors of power, and he did. Norman Borog, I've been to them many places. You take a phone call, call Downing Street and we'll have the Minister for Agriculture for UK pick the call. You take a phone, a small phone, you call the Capitol Hill and you'll make an appointment. For the Green Revolution to move at where, to where it moved, Norman Borough told me, and I had many occasions with him, that he had to move from the laboratory to the offices and to the corridors of power. 
There is nobody who can express himself best for these messages other than a scientist. You may use different mechanisms, but eventually you have to add there. In India, scientists are most of the best scientists are going to swim another. They have got institutions, they have got processes of communicating to the policymakers at all levels. And if you want to have an appointment with the president of India, and you know Swamanathan, he will give you an appointment with the president of India. At instant, he's the one who made those appointments at his hand. Until you have a country, until you have a world that respects knowledge, that respects intellectuals, that respects uh, that level of knowledge, then you will not make a difference. And therefore, it is important to create that, that understanding it is only a country, it's only a situation that respects and that has got very high regard for knowledge-based decision-making process that will actually make these differences. So it is upon ourselves to make sure that we create situations or we do everything possible to make all the political processes, the whole value chain, uh, acknowledge and respect the decision-making process that is based on reliable information. Thank you. Good. Let's have another set of questions. Lou. I don't think Ed quite got the answer to his question, did you, Ed? But, Huria, you did a really interesting study in northern Mali where you learned directly from people how they're managing risk. Would you want to just tell that very quickly? Because it was a really interesting study. Yeah, in northern Mali we tried to understand uh, how people actually react to and cope with uh, climate variability, specifically to drought. And we found, for example, very complex patterns of migration. And this mobility, I mean, I think one point I would totally agree with you is that mobility is not reflected in many uh, adaptation plans or adaptation uh, policies. And that is something I think we should work uh, more on it, as migration is also not, for example, in the red agenda where you are planning something, so you have to, to, to know where people are moving or not. So we learned a lot, and we learned, for example, that migration of men causes also vulnerability of women. So women has to adapt not only to climate variability, but also to the migration of men. So that is really uh, important yeah, to learn also from the local people, how, how they do it. And, and can I ask a question now? <laughs> now that we've answered yes, another can. one. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to come back to Walter and, and, and um, Romano, perhaps. Uh, Walter, you, in the graph you showed us the hell, it, it was really interesting because you had a, a, the long term trend was decreasing, but most of the trends over that time period were, were contrary to the long term trend. And were, you had a long period of increasing, a really significant decrease and then another long-term period of increasing. And, and during those periods of increasing, both the, the, the wetter years and the drier years were, were all getting wetter. And, and during that time of, of, of the really rapid decrease, both the, the wetter and the drier were, were getting drier. And, and so the, these things seem to be correlated in time and, and in ways that are predictable, ways that are perhaps usable. You know, can, can we take these long-term trends, or these medium-term trends, because you talked a lot about the, the interannual variability, but these decadal time trends seem to be robust enough that, that policies and, 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 and measures can be put in place to, to, to take that into account. And Romano, if, if as a policymaker, in, as a PS in, 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 at the Ministry of Agriculture in Kenya, you got information that, you know, we're in a, it's been, the, the rainfall has been increasing in our, in this region of Western Kenya for the past 15 years and we're not, look, we don't see any inflection points. Is that something you could use? Is that something you could make policy on? And, and how, could, how could that information get to you in a way that would be useful? And then what would you do with it in the executive if that came to you to, to, to then move it through the, 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 the corridors of power, as you were saying? Good questions. One more over here. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Samuel from Myanmar, from the uh, Ministry of Environment and Conservation and Forestry. And thank you so much for your very knowledgeable presentations. Uh, actually, this is not a question. It, it will be mixed with a clarification and for the, Christine, you mentioned about the fire. So in terms of that context, um, 
you, sa you said that the uh, secondary forest in adults while plantation can help reduce fire occurrence. Uh, regarding uh, my experience, the forest fire will depend on the types of forest. Um, because you said about the uh, secondary forest or I found um, plantation can stop, the, can reduce the uh, fire occurrence. I think it may lead to the encouraging the deforestation and degradation of the forest. <laughs> this is just my uh, inquiry. Thank you so much. And one of you. Thanks very much. Paul Chatterton is my name from WWF. Um, I, I want to use Ruth's slide um, as a starting point for my, uh, for my question, the slide on res research and where, where it's being done. I think that was extremely instructive. Uh, the problem and the impacts are in the tropics and yet the, the work and the resources are not. So how do we switch that around? The, uh, uh, the, the, this is a generational issue and we can't solve it by actually doing the work, we solve it by building the institutions that will do the work in the tropics. My question back to all of you, and let's focus it on research, there's a whole range of other questions that we have to solve as well, but how do we, how do we transfer those resources and build those institutions in the places where the problems can be solved and where the where the institution where, where they they need to be managed most urgently. And we'll have Ed has got a rebuttal, I think. No. 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 <laughs> okay. Can can you pass the mic? Up? No, it's a completely different question, a, di a different sort of challenge. Because certainly in IUCN, one of the things we are involved with from our perspective is policy influence. And I'd just like to add a little bit to what Dr. Kiyomi was talking about as well. Um, policy, yes, it's not politicians are part of the policy process. We have to politically influence politicians eventually to be able to pass the policy. So in, in one respect, how do we articulate our research findings in a way that a politician will understand? And bear in mind, most politicians have, is it four years or five years to make a difference? That's their time frame. So they want to be able to make some difference to their constituents. Another area of, of engagement, what we've used quite successfully is, in trying to engage with the parliamentary committees, mm -hmm. the, re the relevant or appropriate parliamentary committees, as one of those f uh, formal vehicles, if you will, to actually influence. And the last point, I think, is, yes, I, I, with uh, Professor Bohr, um, I wish there were many more like him who can walk those corridors of power, but more, more of them are like us here, ordinary, ordinary folk. <laughs> and I, I think the... We do need that simple, those fairly simple messages. Like I often tell to people, you, met the, you meet the PS in the lift, what's your five second thing that will get you invited into his or her office? So there's some of the simplicity of message stuff. And to come to bring it together, you know, policy influence is not a linear process. It's very much uh, trying to hit on multiple levels. And I think we've already talked about looking at the media, um, looking at both the science, the technical aspects, as well as working with the politicians. So we, it's not a one-size-fits-all. You've got to hit at many places. Thank you. Good. You start. <laughs> well, going back to your, your, to your, to your earlier question, um, I wanted to, to say at least from my perspective about whether or not we are involved on the ground. Um, all of my students who work internationally, you know, they, they're, they're out there in the field and they get some experience. It is limited though, three to four years, maybe five years. Many of my students have had experience working in other countries before they came, decided to get a PhD. I think it's slightly different 
question. I go to visit them to see what's going on. But if I have a student who's working in Kenya now, as I do, on the molecular biology of microbial diversity, he spends a lot of his time in the lab, he spends a lot of his time learning molecular methods, and that doesn't necessarily go straight back to uh, farmers trying to decide whether they want to add fertilizer to their field or not. Um, so the story I want to tell you is that, you know, I was once at a conference on conservation biology, getting ready for the, um, the meetings in, in Johannesburg. And um, we were talking about willingness to pay methods to value biodiversity. And there was an anthropologist there. Um, and um, uh, 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 she said to us that if you really want to, you know, get this right, you have to go and talk to the people. But that means that you have to spend about maybe about uh, 10 years before you learn how to talk to the people, and maybe another 10 years before you learn how to interpret the answers they gave you. And I think most of us realized we didn't have 20 years um, uh, to do this. So they went back to doing their willingness to pay method, which is just to go in and ask a bunch of questions. And so I guess we, we always will deal with this problem that we, we're always working with a set of um, filters, I guess, where the message goes back and forth between people who are working on very short terms and people who work on long terms. So when the anthropologists can get together with the economists, if we can cooperate rather than distrust each other's methods, I think that, that's um, a good way, to, good way to do it. But I do puzzle over this. I visit, I visit my student for two weeks um, to find out what they're doing. I'm not going to learn the language or the culture, um, and I hope that they've learned some more. Perhaps we can have uh, the climate questions for Walter okay. and Roman. So, <clears throat> on the decadal time scales, uh, first of all, the, uh, there's a, now, right now, there's a lot of investment in, in research to try to understand, quantify, and hopefully predict this variability at the decadal time scale. Uh, uh, so far, it's, it's very hard. It's very, it's, uh, in the case of the Sahel, it is pretty clear that it's linked to sea surface temperatures. But in other places, like for example in Southeast South America, something that looks like the Gale may be a, a slowing in the just trends due to ozone. So it, it's, a, it, it's a line of very active research right now. And in fact, in, in many places, it may just be noise. This what looks like a decay of variability. Um, even in places like the Sahel, though, where the decay of variability is, I think, is better understood, and there is a pretty good chance of being able to predict it, it's still m a minor source of variation compared to the interannual. No? So even, even in those places, you, you can explain about 25 or so of the total variability. Now, what is really interesting, and I think that's where you're going, is that if, if you can characterize or uh, even better predict those decades, for example, decades of, of lower than normal temp uh, precipitation, you can be pretty sure that those will be decades with more frequent droughts. And that, that is what, what really matters. So, in short, I think this is, as I said, a, a very active field of research. Science is advancing, but still a lot to learn. And where it ends being predictable, I think it can be a big help in, in, in that sense. In, in not because of the variability, the decay variability in itself, but because of the frequency, the chances of higher frequency of damaging effects like droughts. Roman? Uh, uh, from Louis, uh, I think uh, the, the model presented quite practical uh, output in terms of the results. It's very correct that uh, the, the, the times of the decrease and the times of increase are, have been felt, practically felt in the, in the East African region. Uh, the variability has practically been felt in the, in, in the East African region. But then, the response has been probably fragmented. Uh, if you take the response on country by country basis, probably except Kenya, there is no other country that responded. And I think practically in Kenya, 
It's not Kenya who always responded. I responded. I was there. I was taking the decisions. You know very well I started the Research Management Initiative before I left the Kenyan Agricultural Research Institute. And I actually wrote the paper itself that started the DMI, yes, eh? in 1997. And we had a large program that went out, took information of what's happening in the north, and therefore resilient programs and activities started immediately. Uh, after that, I started the, the, the SLM program, the Sustainable Land, Land Management Program, uh, which was supported strongly by GEF and a few others. I was involved in drafting the National Environmental Management Program. I was deeply involved in doing the carbon fund, which we have in the country. Uh, so these efforts have got to have champions. And that's why you see there's quite a lot of activities in, uh, in Kenya, compared to other countries around the East and Central African region. Yet, the effect was actually not in one country. It was in the region. You go to Uganda, you find nothing in Tanzania, you find nothing in to Ethiopia, you find nothing. You, Kenya, you come to Kenya, you find a lot of activities going on. A lot of these activities and something to do. I don't have to do it myself, but I was behind the scenes in getting most of these things done. You know how long it took for me to do the SRM, to get the $10 million from, the, the, from GEF. It's now a worldwide program. He knows the kind of things we did with that on people, land management, and environmental change and wrote papers that actually influenced Wangali Madai to change from a position of Shamba system yeah, to a different system. I wrote that paper, we wrote that paper with that. So a lot of this work, that's why I'm saying it takes to move from scientist to different places. That's why I moved from where I was and I want now to be more a scientist because I like to talk more in different ways. So I make appointment now with the president, I mean with the, with the minister in Uganda or Tanzania, or I'll get an appointment because they know we have been doing certain things together and I may want to influence them that way rather than influencing them myself and doing one simple thing in my own country because I found that the differences are, are, are huge. So that information has been useful, but then it's been useful on the spot in various ways. We now have got a very large program on drought resilience program of about $50 million that I just finalized when you, I mean before I left the, the government. We have a climate change unit almost in every department of agriculture, of research, of environment, and, well, although I hear they are not getting as much support as they were getting when I was there. So some of these things, you need a few people to get them done, and some of that information you provided has actually been useful, because I knew about it even long before then, when I did the DMI and all those, that information we knew about it. How can we get more than done in the developed world, developing world? That is my greatest fear. Some of the models that I was working with before I left science itself have not moved an inch since I left them. Some of the work we are doing with you and we are doing with you, you have not moved an inch since we, I, I left them myself. I don't know I could be wrong, but I want to find out how do we get more of this work being done by, in, the, in the developed world by the national scientists. As long as work is being done in America, as long as it's being done in Britain, and you know the political operations that are there, if you come with something, you bring something foreign in, 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 in African countries, you find a lot of these things not being adopted. I'm saying this very strongly because my Minister for Environment told me Kiyomi, you spent 12 years overseas. I don't know how much you are influenced by those people. <laughs> so when you come and mention these things, most of the time I believe you, but I want to be careful with you. It's true I, I spent a long time overseas studying and working and things like that. But when they have some of these people working themselves there, they know them from grassroots and they go and present information and they are able to make these decisions much quicker and less apprehensive than they work when the work is done outside. And that's why I started programs like such as Bioscience for East and Central Africa. It was one of the concepts I started myself because I believe that if we have to move in the advanced science, we have to bring that advancement being done in Africa itself. And uh, for some of you who have worked with us, we know how we was able to go around the world, list that a million dollars, list another 60 million dollars with the, with the, with the, with the, with the Bureau and Merida Gates to have African scientists link up with the rest of the world scientists to do the work there and produce the reports and output there. I'm saying this very, as you see, passionately because it's one of the subjects I'm very passionate about. Producing simple messages. The policymakers, as we have said, it's really very important. But it's important to understand when you come and learn something like what you learned from the pastoralists the other day, uh, the, the, the question I put that question, is. It's not really that you learned something. It is because you went in an environment that you don't know anything about. If you go in an environment that you don't know anything about, everything you meet, you learn. So you have to combine about knowing what is there versus bringing new information.
and uh, 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 I mean influencing the decision making process. So there's a lot we can say about this, but until, I mean, for example, it took a very long time for us. I happen to have been sitting in the, in the, in the fund council of the CGIR. And I strongly, I've sat there for more than six years, including the Exco and the fund council. It took a long time to convince them to have a climate change charity program. I don't know there is now a climate change charity program. We had to fast track it because, because some of us did really a push for it. So some of these things need champions. And it's up for new people to establish champions. One champion can make a lot of difference, can actually sit for 100 scientists. Thank you. So Paul, I don't think we answered your question, but I think we totally agree that we have to change the picture in Ruth's diagram in the next decade. Uh, Christine, you want to do the fire question? Well, no, actually, I, I think Ruth should do the fire question, since okay. this was re uh, work that was supervised by her, but then I reserve the right to say something about anthropologists and those 20 years they need, okay? <laughs> okay. Before the, the fire question, can I say something about the Borlaug question? <laughs> so before we have too much Borlaug envy, um, it's true that scientists are terrible communicators, you complicate the message and, and uh, all of that. But um, Borlaug and Swaminathan had something really positive to say, you know, increasing yields. That's, that's a really good, um, a good result of science to take to the, to the corridors of power. Um, we have at least, uh, okay, I have gotten stuck in the world of, of being, no, you know, the message is don't do this, don't do that, we're ruining the world, reduce emissions, um, framing our message in terms of what shouldn't be done rather than what could be done. So I think we have to think about how we can turn our science around from uh, from the message being we're doing something wrong to mm -hmm. what can we do to, uh, to improve that is more politically palatable and likely to be, uh, to be accepted. Um, fire. So uh, the interesting result of this, this work about fire was that the precipitation anomaly is the overriding variable th that determines whether there's fire or not and how big the, the fire is. But that the type of forest, the type of land cover can mediate or exacerbate that impact. So secondary forests we find in, in, uh, in non-drought years can reduce the impact of fire and in drought years increase, enhance the impact of fire, which likely has to do with fuel load and um, moisture and uh, aspects like that. But the, the really interesting finding out of this was that adult oil palm, so once oil palm becomes mature, has a mitigating effect on fire, reduces the likelihood that fire will spread, which speaks to the conclusion that we know that the precipitation anomaly is overriding. That's a factor, a, a result of global climate. We can't really do much about that. But we can um, think about how we manage the landscape and configure the landscape to reduce the likelihood that forest will spread. And while you know, we might not think about oil palm in a positive light for biodiversity and other, other aspects, uh, in terms of um, mitigating fire, it's, it, in this setting, uh, seems to have a positive impact once it becomes mature. I don't know if that answers your question. I think we should wrap up. And so... Christine, oh, Christine you wanted to do a rebuttal on the 20 years. Okay, no. well, yeah. Uh, I, I did also want to add that uh, the mature forests were not in that in that diagram, you know. So it, we weren't looking at at mature forests, which we assume would be different from the sort of secondary forests that we were looking at. So, but um, well, I uh, quite frankly, I um, 
I, I think the message that I want to give is a little complex, right? Um, which we're supposed to be uh, giving simple messages, but no. Um, I, the, 20 years is an exaggeration. But um, the idea that we do want to include um, local um, adaptation um, in what we in 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 what we want to suggest are ways that uh, are um, um, important messages and trying to increase the ability of people to adapt. And the truth is that yes, it takes it often takes some times and it takes some knowledge of what is going on. And um, I know that these days somehow saying that. You, you know, it takes the time to learn a language if people really can't, uh, don't know the language at all. Um, it seems to be sort of unpopular. Um, rapid appraisals of any, everything seem to be the thing. But, uh, you know, we're talking about policies that change people's lives. Um, and while we're worried about whether we can do it in two weeks or a year, um, you know, taking that year or learning that language or finding somebody who can speak that language May actually be worth the maybe worth the time that you spend on it. So I'm I'm not I'm 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 not uh, uh, you know I I don't mean to to sound angry or or whatever at it. But the truth is that these are incredibly important issues. These are policies that really can affect people's lives, um, and occasionally. Um, um, whether it, what's necessary is time or humility or a, a lack of hubris, assuming that we know what, how people's lives should be changed in order to improve their livelihood options. Sometimes it actually, you know, it, it, may, it may be worth um, taking, uh, taking a little bit extra, putting a little bit more effort into it, um, using either method, research methods or or, um, or finding the, the proper people to do the, that research, um, um, and that, that may actually be important. So I think it's, it's not something to be, to be um, completely dismissed in, in the name of efficiency or simple messages. Good, and so Lou is gonna give us, he's gonna do a brilliant summary of the session. <laughs> a summary, but we'll see if, uh, how well I capture it. But, but, but actually, I, I cheated a little bit and, and did ask folks to provide me with, with major conclusions from their, their talks beforehand. Um, and, and I have taken uh, some notes about the discussion. Um, but I think one of the things we, we uh, heard from Walter is that the traditional approach to improving adaptation to climate change and, and, and uh, climate change-based scenarios, the traditional way has, has some serious limitations for decision making. And then some of these complementary approaches using uh, medium-term uh, assessments of, of climate variability and, and, and interannual uh, variability, and starting with adaptation to current climate variability as, as the way to move forward for, for a variability to future climate change, helps bring the problem back to the here and now, uh, helps bring the problem back to, to the time frames that, that policymakers are, are making decisions, that, that land managers are making decisions. Um, and, um, that the, the challenges of, of effectively incorporating adaptation to climate variability and climate, in, and climate change in, in policy and decision making is possible with these approaches to help overcome some of these challenges. Um, we heard about, uh, from, from Miguel about landscape transitions and, and one of the conclusions that, that uh, Christine brought out was that um, the way land tra transitions are, are moving, we're, we're, we're seeing a, a, a coarsening of the scale. The, these landscape mosaics are moving from, from fine scale um, uh, mosaics to, to much more coarse mosaics with larger fields, larger uh, areas of forest, um, and, and uh, um, that, uh, that these, thing, the, these changes have, have, have human reasons, to have sometimes to do with migration, sometimes to do with, with uh, land tenure. Um, and and it, it's, a, it's a very dynamic process with many things going on in the landscape um, uh, associated with, with the human system as well as with the, the natural system. Um, that that uh, increased incident of, of fires is one manifestation of transitions in tropical landscapes and one of the effects of the, uh, one that affects the ability of communities to adapt to climate change. Um, so so the, the work in the, in the Peruvian Amazon um, shows that the changes are complex and the effects of particular changes on the probability of destructive fires occurring is, is non-linear. So that there, there are some things that we can do about how we manage vegetation to, to reduce the probability of fire in a region where it traditionally doesn't have fire. Um, and the systems and tools for, for adaptation um, 
Well, we heard from, from the policymakers that, that, that perhaps tools are not welcome, but, but scientists love to make tools. Um, and, and we, you know, it's, um, but, but there are early opportunities for early warning systems about fire because some of the, the, the dimensions of climate are predictable and, and there are correlations in sea surface temperature that give us advanced warnings and, and setting up advanced warning systems. Uh, Romano was talking a bit about the, the, um, the drought warning, uh, drought monitoring uh, center in, in, in East Africa. Similar types of things for fires in the Amazon are, are also possible. Um, Shahid talked a little bit about, the, or a lot about, the, the, the diversity and, and the, the functional side of diversity. Um, that uh, um, the, the literature is, is enormous and complex and difficult to understand, but the outcome of 20 years of research draws some very clear and, and, and concrete conclusions um, that, that diversity does lead to resilience, diversity does lead to to more ecosystem functions, that, that um, maximizing ecosystem, uh, ecosystem services requires diversity, and we need to be able to communicate that clearly. Um, the IPCC acknowledges the importance for bi of biodiversity as an integral to the climate systems at all scales, but often neglects to include biodiversity in some of its major findings, and UNFCCC does lip service to, to biodiversity as much as, as the, the, the CBD makes references to, 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 to climate change, but there's, a, there's, a, there's still a bit of a, a silo effect um, uh, in how these are dealt with in international policy. And that biodiversity is not about species riches, it's, it's, um, it's not about conser uh, conservation biology. Um, so, so that a, a campaign to clarify what biodiversity is and its role in producing more efficient, robust, and durable management strategies would benefit both decision makers and researchers. Um, and so, so there, we need to be cognizant of the fact that this disjoint nature of conventions on biodiversity um, creates confusion leading to countries being parts of international agreements that lack integration and miss opportunities for synergy. Ruth talked a, a bit about some, um, uh, uh, an interesting study on 4,000 households of smallholder farmers across multiple countries and, and shows that this indicates that climate essential is, information for, is in, essential for farmers to adapt to climate change through altering planting times, seed varieties, other management practices. However, climate is only one of the many reasons why farmers change practices depending upon region and local context. And there's a body of research on climate adaptation is, is a bit biased towards developed countries. And, and I think that was a, a striking. It came back in the, in the, um, in, in the conversation afterwards. Um, it rarely tracks uh, changes over time scales long enough to assess the effectiveness of adaptation and the effectiveness of policies put in place to, to promote adaptation. Um, Romano talked to us a, a lot about the, the complexities of of um, policy making in, in uh, African, the African context, the context that he has strong first-hand knowledge of. And it, it's, I think one of the take-home messages is that it, it's a bit messy as a, as a context. It, it, the, the legislatures are often ver not very informed, um, and, and, uh, but these legislatures are the representatives of the people. They're, they're elected by the people, that they, and they're making decisions that are appropriate for the people. That very often, a lot of the information rests within the executive. Um, and so there's, there's a need for scientists to, to be communicating at several levels, but also a need to be building networks to, to get information to move between levels. Um, and very often there's a, there's a bias in the, the, the attitudes that, that um, mitigation is not a problem of developing countries. Mitigation, you know, the problem is created by developed countries and, and uh, there's a lack, perhaps a, a lack of understanding why countries need to, to follow low emissions development pathways. Um, and, and that, that I, I think as, as scientists and as, as international policy regimes wanting to have an, an impact in Africa, perhaps the entry point isn't mitigation. The entry point is, is adaptation. And, and if mitigation could be accomplished as, as a secondary byproduct, there are perhaps opportunities there. But clearly in Africa, mitigation is not the entry point. Um, in Kenya, as in many uh, African countries, there are no formal mechanisms for policymakers to interact with scientists, and it's done on an ad hoc basis. And we heard that, that you know, the, the meetings and, and, and conferences are perhaps not the most effective way to get information into the hands of, of policymakers um, that, in ways that, that result in, in decisions. Um, and scientists need to support and better articulate the consequences of climate change in simple languages that can be understood by non-specialists. You know, the, the complex message just doesn't get through. Policymakers are confronted with numerous problems. So, so one day they're dealing with a health crisis and, and de making decisions about vaccination. The next day they're dealing with, with agricultural productivity. The next day they have water and sanitation. The, you know, where does, where does, how do we, we communicate the importance of climate in, in these um, uh, 
in, in what they're, they're dealing with, and perhaps maybe not isolating climate as a policy imperative, but integrating climate into the other policy imperatives would be one way forward. Um, he made the point that, that, that policy is not politics, and that, that policy is long term. Politics is perhaps short term, and, and uh, so there are opportunities there to, to affect change. Um, and I think the, the, the discussion went, there was a, uh, several different trains within the discussion. One was about the, the learning from and building on uh, adaptation strategies that are already there in the landscape, and, and that, that um, there is traditional knowledge, there are traditional uh, uh, adaptation strategies. We, we need, as scientists, we need to document it and, and understand that, but help policymakers also link with, with what people are currently doing uh, um, for, for adaptation. Um, there was a bit of a discussion on just how much, well, the, the, how much effort and what, what is the type of effort and who should be doing this research. You know, uh, Romano spoke very eloquently, I think, for the need for more linkage between African science and, and international science and, and the opportunities there for African scientists and, and the, the imperative for African scientists to be in the vanguard of, of um, moving this forward. And perhaps as much as you need champions within within the corridors of power to, to bring about these changes. You also need champions within the, the scientific communities. So I, I think that that's, those are some of the big topics I think that we covered today. And uh, maybe I'll just leave it there. And, and, uh, but I, I would like to thank the, the, the panel. It's been a lot of fun putting this whole thing together and, and, and um, uh, working on the messages and, and, and crafting the messages and, and crafting this. Um, so I hope everybody else found it useful, found the discussion uh, fruitful. Um, and what folks will be here for the next, uh, well, at least for the next uh, day. So, so please interact with, with uh, the panelists and interact amongst yourselves as you've heard interesting topics of conversation come up here. So thank you all very much. And Bruce.